Hey, good morning, folks. We're uh, so glad that each of you are here this morning. Uh, you could be praying for uh, different folks in our church. I know that there is uh, the normal flu sickness going around, so we have some folks who are out this week because of that. And uh, so just want to make mention of that to you. If you're doing the gentle and lowly study, we are up to chapter 4 this week. So the verse card for chapter 4 is located right down here by the organ, as well as the first three verse cards as well. So we encourage you to pick those up. Uh, you know, last week was a really good chapter. Uh, and it's like, wow, is there a good, more good chapters? Chapter 4 is really good. Uh, it's really good because you're building upon what you've studied so far. And one of the things you're going to find out is about how Jesus sympathizes with us. And when you look at, you know, we use that word all the time, I sympathize with you. Well, we don't really know what that word means sometimes. And what it means is he joins in our suffering. And when you think about that, Jesus joining in our suffering, that's a pretty amazing thing. So you're going to enjoy this week's chapter, and so I encourage you with that. If you haven't gotten a book yet, we have books, and uh, so they're located down here. And uh, we'll see about getting you a study guide as well. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we're going to start today. We have some band members who are away this week, and some who are not feeling well. And so let's stand together, and we'll ask God's blessing as we worship the Lord this morning. Father, we do thank you for your love for us, for the opportunity to just meet here and meet with you. Lord, to be honest with you, all of this is a meaningless exercise unless you meet with us. And so we pray that your presence would be very real to each and every one of us, that your spirit would be speaking to us, encouraging us as we worship you, as our hearts are attuned to you. Help us to lay aside whatever it is that we faced this last week and whatever it is that we're going to face in the coming week, help us to lay that all aside and focus on you because we need you. And so we're asking now that you would meet with us as we worship you, as we listen to your word, as we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, let's worship together. <coughs>
You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. didn't want heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater what could separate us now what a wonderful name What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silence the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no the glory yours is the name above all names what a powerful name it is what a powerful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a powerful name it is nothing can stand again what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Okay, you may be seated. That was, a, that was a really great song there. We just sang what a powerful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. You know, we, we have a saying here at the church, it's more than a worship service. And sometimes I need to remind myself that, and I need to remind you of that, because here, here's what happens. We sometimes forget in our Christianity what this is all about what our coming to church, our worshiping, our praying is all about. It's not because 
we belong to a church or it's not because we believe a set of doctrine and and trust me believing doctrine is important to your christian life but i'll be honest with you when you're going through the midst of something and some of you are you're not holding on because you have a doctrine you're not seeing yourself through the next day because you got the right belief or I went to church. It's because you have Jesus and he's real. That, that, that is what it's all about, folks. It's about Jesus and knowing his presence in your life in the midst of what you're going on. See, because you can get distracted by the other stuff and you can say, oh, well, you know, I go to church and I'm okay. Yeah, but that's not going to get you through life. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Or, uh, I believe all the right things. Yeah, but that's not going to get you through life. I mean, you, what's going to get you through life is Christ. And why we come here is not just for a ritual. Why we come here is because you want to meet with him as his still, small voice, as his spirit speaks to you as he knows exactly what's going on in your life right now and what's coming up and what you've gone through and what, what are the hurts, what are the things you desire from him. He knows them. I don't know those. You know them. He knows them. He knows them better than you do. He knows what your week is going to hold, what you're facing. And so you come here and you come to meet with him. And say, God, speak to me. Give me peace. Let me know you're there. And really, that's what prayer's about. Prayer is just not an exercise. Prayer is talking to him. It's building that relationship with him. So, okay, you've come in here this week, and you're here for whatever reason, and God has led you here. And we're going to talk about the internal pull later on as we get into God's word but you've got something on your mind and on your heart maybe it's a loved one who needs jesus maybe it's a loved one who needs healing god I, i'm praying for my loved one they're struggling health wise god they need you maybe it's i'm facing some sort of difficulty and i need an answer a resolution i need help well, let's go to him and talk to him about it. Let's go to him and say, Lord, here it is. Can you work in this situation? Can you bring healing? Because only you can. So let's pray, okay? Lord, we do love you. Forgive us for our sins. We, we do sin. We, we try not to. But Lord, you know that. You know everything about us. But you also know that we love you. And that's why we're here. We're not here just to attend a service. We're not here just to sing some songs, listen to a message. We're here to meet with you. And, and that's really what's most important, isn't it? Spending time with you as a church family where we can encourage each other, where we can be the hands of Jesus for each other. So Lord, we're, we're here and, and I pray that you would, first of all, help us to grow in our relationship with you. I know there are some, Lord, that they had a strong relationship with you at one time. They really believed you would do great things in their life. They really were trusting in you, but then something didn't happen the way they thought should happen. Or you didn't answer, and 
they became disappointed. They became hurt. And so they quit expecting. I guess that's a good word, isn't it, Lord? And so they've grown cold. Lord, would you stir their hearts again? Would you help them to realize the love that you have for them? That you care for them? That you didn't abandon them? That you didn't look away with whatever difficulty and struggle it was? You were right there with them? Help them to know that they just need to keep trusting in you and meeting with you? Or could you restore to them the joy of their salvation again? Would you do that for all of us? So that we can be in awe of you again? Would you stir our hearts? Would you make us alive again, Lord? And so, Lord, you know, you know that while we struggle and while we may be disappointed and while that affects how we come to you, you know we still need you. That's why we're here. We're still, to be honest with you, Lord, there's, there's within us that hope that somehow we can talk to you. Help us to see it's more than just a hope, it's a reality. That you haven't changed towards us. And we can come to you and talk to you. And, and so, Lord, we, we come to you with, with the things that are on our hearts. The loved ones who need Jesus. The loved ones who need healing. The loved ones who need to be healed in their lives of whatever scars they're carrying. Homes that need to be mended healing that needs to be brought in relationships. God, we're, we're here with, with our, our struggles, with our issues, and, and with, the, with the, really an exasperation on our part because we really don't know what to do. But you do. And you know exactly what we're facing and you know what we need. So Lord, we give them to you. They're too, too hard a burden for us to bear. It overwhelms us. We give them to you and ask that your spirit would be working in these situations that that you would be giving us peace to know, I've heard you. Can you let us know that, Lord? I have heard you. And then with faith and trust, to trust you. And Lord, could you draw us closer to you, even closer than what we asked before? Because, Lord, we do love you. And we do need you. And so I pray that your spirit would work in each of these situations that have not been spoken, but are here on the hearts of many. Do your work, Father. And give us peace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, folks, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, if you're using a pew Bible, that is page 564. John chapter 6. Now, again, we are going through the Gospel of John, wanting to get to know Jesus, get to know him in an intimate way in our own lives, plus also learn how he acts in our lives, 
but also see how people react to him. Now, I mentioned to you last week that when you go through the Gospel of John, you're going to see that there are basically three groups of people and how they react towards him. So there are the followers, there's the disciples, there are those who, who believe him to be who he is, the Messiah, and they want to commit to follow him. You're going to see the religious folks. That's whether they are the Pharisees or the priests. These are the folks who are, quote, following the Torah and, and they're following the Old Testament law, but they don't believe him for whatever reason, and we'll see many reasons why they choose not to believe him and not follow him. They become antagonistic towards him, and uh, they hate him. They want rid of him. But then there's the crowd. And these are the people, to be honest with you, that the religious folks don't like. They refer to them as sinners and drunkards and tax collectors. It's the crowd. They like Jesus, but they are motivated by different things. They're motivated in many different ways because Jesus, what we've just seen with the crowd that he's addressing here in chapter 6, have been fed by him. 5,000 people fed with five barley loaves, real small, and two fish the size of sardines. So they want Jesus, they want to make him a king because he can feed them, satisfy them temporarily. But Jesus is actually talking to them, and let's kind of wrap up what we've looked at so far in John 6. He's kind of presenting to them that he understands what's motivating them, and what's motivating them isn't a desire for the Messiah or for what God wants. What's motivating them is what they want. What they want to get out of God, what they want to get out of the Messiah. Temporary satisfaction. And, and let's just stop for a moment. That happens in church, too. We, we come to God not because we really want God, but because we want what God can do for us. And then I've seen people get very angry when God doesn't do it, and they leave. When I say leave, I don't mean just physically leave the church. I mean mentally leave their faith. They're done. And this is the crowd. And so in the midst of this discussion with this crowd of who he is and what he has to offer, he's actually wanting them to understand that what he has to offer is more than just a full belly. It's actually life. Life that goes on forever. And they don't understand. They can't comprehend. They don't see it. And so what follows here is we're going to continue in his discussion where Jesus talks about himself as being the bread of life. And so what we're going to look at today in verses 43 through 51, he's going to talk a little bit more about the whole issue of coming to him in salvation and what that means and how you got there. And that what actually was going on was An internal pull. Something was pulling you from the inside towards him. Because I want you to understand, when you came to Jesus, yes, you made that decision to follow him. You gave your life to him. And you, whether you prayed or, or you physically made a motion to say, Lord, I'm following you, you gave your life to him. But I'm going to explain something to you. The desire to come to him, to even go down the road and look at him, that didn't come from you. Well, I'll, we'll look at it and we'll see where it came from here in a moment. So let's look together. We're going to look at verses 43 through 51. We're going to start off with verse 43. It's going to focus on some confusion when it comes to Jesus, there's always confusion. And then we're going to look and see what he says. Look with me, verse 43. Jesus, therefore, answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets... 
and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. There is a bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I give for the life of the world. All right, so let's take a look at what he's saying here. First of all, we're going to see some confusion. What do you mean confusion? Well, Jesus says to them, stop murmuring. Why were they murmuring? Well, if you go back to verse 42, they were murmuring about what Jesus says about his being the bread of life. How's that possible? We know who he is. Isn't he the son of of Joseph and Mary. We know them. They were among us here. We've seen this boy all of his life. Who does he think he is? We understand that kind of thinking, right? When we see folks grow up among us and then it all of a sudden seems like they're real important, some people have a hard time with that. Who does he think he is? That's what they're struggling with here. So there's confusion. Then we're going to see the internal work. See, you coming to Christ or anyone coming to Jesus is an internal work. Now that's going to set some of you free. Okay? That's going to set some of you free, so I want you to, to realize that. So let's take a look, first of all, at the confusion. When you look at verse 43 and Jesus telling them not to murmur because they're complaining among themselves, what's going on here? Well, here's the first thing I want you to see. They held preconceived ideas about God and the Messiah. They held preconceived ideas about God and his Messiah. So recognize something. These are Jews. Even though these are really maybe not what we would call practicing Jews, they maybe did go to the temple, but they're not looked upon as being one who, ones who would, who would adhere to every aspect of the law, like the Pharisees or whatever. They still had a concept of God, and they still had a concept of the Messiah. Why do you think they wanted to make him king? Because he gave them bread. So they had some sort of concept, but they didn't have a complete concept. And their concept of Jesus, excuse me, the Messiah and what God does was pretty narrow. So here comes Jesus, who actually blows the whole concept that they had about who the Messiah was and what he wanted to do away, and they can't handle that. They especially can't handle it when it turns out that it's a guy who comes from among them. They have these preconceived ideas. Their preconceived ideas of the Messiah was somebody who's going to show up on a white horse with a sword overthrowing the Romans, allowing the nation of Israel to once again be what it was under King David. But here comes this Jesus. Jesus. And he's not like that. And what he's calling them to is something different than what they want. See, this is the problem today. A lot of our conceptions about God is the God who will do what we want or bring about what we want. What they were wanting was freedom from oppression. Someone who would overthrow the Romans and allow their nation to be great again. But that's not what God was wanting. God, actually, when he was talking to Pilate later on, we see what he says, my kingdom is not of this world. He's actually wanting to talk to them about a greater issue. The greater issue isn't the oppression of the Romans. The greater issue is what? Their lives and where they're headed. And what will the outcome be? He came to solve that problem. See, they had these preconceived ideas about God and the Messiah, and so they're arguing among themselves. Now, here's what happens. The second thing, these preconceived ideas hinder them from seeing the truth. 
So when you have these preconceived ideas about who God is and how he acts, you can't see it. Because all you see is what you're holding on to and the possibility that God may actually act beyond that is inconceivable. It's inconceivable. So here we go. We see this confusion going on. So Jesus is trying to explain something to them. He's wanting them to understand a greater point. So again, he's going to get back to the whole discussion about he being the bread of life, which, which is something they're having a hard time understanding. But he's wanting them to understand. And what he's going to help them to understand is, is that it's an internal work. So listen, I, I, I want this, what we're going to look at here from what Jesus is explaining to us, I want it to be something that will open your eyes to the reality of the life that he's given you. W what do you mean by that, George? Well, I used to operate this way. I find that a lot of Christians operate this way. They think that their Christian life is what they do. And so if you're not doing the right things, then you must not be a good Christian. Or you must not be in the right relationship with him, which therefore means he won't answer your prayers. Talk about a preconceived idea, right? But the reality is, is that's not how God works. So for instance, let's talk about it. Let's talk about salvation for a moment before we look at what Jesus says. Does everybody understand that when you got saved, it had nothing to do with who you are or what you have done? Everybody understand that? Would everybody agree with that? Your salvation is based upon what who has done. Jesus has done on the cross for you, dying there, right? Paying the sacrifice for your sin. Did you ask him to do that? No. Well, we weren't alive then, George. The folks back then didn't ask him to do that. So salvation is very much a what? A work of God in your life, right? And that's true even as you live your life now. It's God working in your life right now. So let's see about it. Because remember, he said he's the one who brings satisfaction to us. What kind of satisfaction? Well, last week we talked about how there is something within us that wants something more, right? And we're trying to fulfill what we want with something more. And then here we are, we're doing everything we can with all this other stuff. If I get a new vehicle, then I'll be satisfied. If I get that buck, I'll be satisfied. You know what? You know what? We, we don't get satisfied. Not at all. That's not how the world operates. But here's what he's going to tell us is, is that desire that you were wanting that needs to be fulfilled, it didn't come from you. What do you mean, George? Well, let's look at it together. We're going to talk about the inward work. Here's what he's going to show us. First of all, look with me at verse 44. This is something that should free you, especially if you're sharing the gospel with somebody else. Okay? Listen to me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, this isn't George that just said this. This is Jesus. Nobody comes to him. Nobody comes to Jesus unless who draws them? The Father. The Father is working in their lives for whatever period of time he's working in their lives to draw them. He's the one, the Father, he is the one who's what? Creating the desire in their heart for something more. Do you understand? And so when they have that desire for something more, they go looking to fulfill it, and when they come to Jesus, it's because he 
get it. So here's what Jesus, Jesus stresses that people come to him because the Father draws them. We say, well, that's great, George, because the people I'm concerned about who don't have Jesus, they're not even interested, let alone looking. Yeah. So now you know how to pray, right? God, they're not going to come to Jesus unless you draw them. Would you do a work in their heart? Would you show them their need? Would you draw them to Jesus? That's what I want, Lord. I want you to create in them a, a desire that can only be fulfilled in Jesus. That's how you pray. In fact, that should, should free some of you. What do you mean? So, okay, I have loved ones. You have loved ones who don't know Jesus, and we share Jesus with them. And, and, and I oftentimes will come away from that whole experience defeated. Have you ever come away from the experience defeated talking to them? Because you feel like, what more could I say? It's not you. They don't see it. And the desire is not there. It's the Father who draws them. That's, that's how you start praying here. This is what Jesus is saying. And, and when they come to him, what does he say? Look with me again, verse 44. He says, and I will raise them up in the last day. What is that? They'll be resurrected. Here's the second thing he says. It's that internal work. Look with me at verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Here's the second thing you need to understand about it being an eternal work. The Father helps people to understand his word so that they come to Jesus. Again, it's the work of the Father. I would say we know a little bit more as we get into the epistles. It's the work of the Spirit who gives you understanding when you share. So when you see somebody who comes to Christ, when they make that decision, it's because the Father was already giving them understanding to what they are presented. Have you ever talked to somebody about the Bible and they had no clue about what you're talking about? They just couldn't see it. I remember years ago I was listening to a radio program. I'm kind of a news junkie. I was listening to a news program, it was a commentary thing, and they had a guy on there who was some kind of lawyer, and he said, you know, I read through the entire Bible, and I listened to him, and I, it just didn't make sense to me, the guy said. And I knew exactly what was going on. You can read through the whole Bible, and if there's no one showing you, that is, God isn't opening your eyes to it, it's not going to make sense. But here's what Jesus is saying. When the Father, he'll teach you, what he's quoting from Isaiah, he's quoting from the prophet Isaiah here, when the Father teaches you, then you will come to me, because the Father is the one who opens your eyes. So guess what, folks? We've got to say what in our prayers? God, open their eyes to the truth. Open their eyes so that they understand. And that, that's very much confirmed by the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's not that our gospel is veiled. It's not that the message of Jesus is hidden from people. It's that the God of this world, who's that Satan, has what? Blinded their eyes to the truth. So you pray that way now. God opened their eyes. Show them who he is. Listen, folks, when you, if you think for, for a moment, whether you were as a child or like myself as a 19-year-old, a, uh, when you came to an understanding of who he is and what he did for you, and you decided to follow him, that understanding just didn't erupt from your thinking. 
it was because God opened your eyes to see it and to understand. And you responded. That's what he's saying here. Here's another thing I want you to see here. Look with me. We're going to look at verse 46. So here's what Jesus is saying. This, this is, would not be acceptable today. What do you mean? Well, here's what it says. Not that anyone has seen God, seen the Father, except him who is from God. He has seen the Father. What's he doing here? Here's what I want you to see. Jesus makes the exclusive claim that no one has seen the Father except him. That's an exclusive claim. I don't care if somebody else says, I've seen God. No, you haven't. How can you say that, George? Well, the scripture makes it very clear. God doesn't show himself to people. Remember Moses? I want to see you, Lord. I can't show you me. But I'll show you my backside. I'll show you my back when I'm passing by. I'll let you see me walking by. But nobody's seen him face to face. And here's, here's Jesus. What is he saying? No one has seen the Father except him who comes from the Father. He has seen him. And what's Jesus been saying? I'm coming from the Father. He's making the exclusive claim here that I am the one who sees the Father. And when he works in your heart to draw you to me, that's where salvation is. Here's the other thing I want you to see with me. Look at verse 47. Again, to reiterate that what he's offering you is truly satisfying. He says in verse 47, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Believing in him. What kind of believing? Well, here's the point. Jesus states that the one who truly believes in him has everlasting life truly believes. See, our English word is not as encompassing as the languages in which it was written. We, you can believe something. Well, you know what? I can believe that when I go to the mechanic or when I go to the doctor, they are who they are, but I can choose whether or not I really believe that and do what they're telling me to do. When a mechanic says, George, ease up on this with the vehicle. I could choose to believe that or just keep doing what I'm doing, right? When I go to the doctor and he says, George, ease up on the sugar. It's my choice, right, to believe, truly believe him and ease up on the sugar, right? This is the issue. When you come to Jesus and believe him, there are people who say they believe in Jesus. I meet lots of people who believe in Jesus but that believing in Jesus doesn't change anything with their lives. They believe Jesus like 2 plus 2 equals 4. But those who truly believe, by truly believing is you are committed to him. And that impacts you. Do, do you know what I mean? Let, let's talk about it in terms of human relationships, okay? Okay. All of us have somebody in our lives, I hope you do, you have somebody in your life that is there for you, who's committed to you, who loves you. I hope that's true, okay? And, and, and when you think about your trust in them, you trust them, you believe them, so that when they say, I will be there for you, you don't even hesitate, you know what? They'll be there for you because you believe them. And that's not just two plus two, folks. Your belief goes beyond just a mental acknowledgement that, yeah, I can trust what they say. You know that they'll do it. Did you understand? And that's the kind of believing he's talking about here. He's saying that those who know me, who believe me, who trust me, they'll have what? Everlasting life. And so that you understand what I'm talking about with everlasting life, he makes a key point here, especially when we get down to verse 48. He's going to say this. Look with me at verse 48 and 49. 
I am the bread of life. So he's wanting them to understand, what are you believing them? I am the bread of life. And so here's what he's wanting to make the distinction. Verse 49, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. He's wanting to distinguish between somebody who's just going to satisfy you temporarily to somebody who's going to give you everlasting life. He's saying, look, your fathers, they ate bread from heaven in the form of manna, but guess what? They're dead now. Why? Because it only satisfied them for what? That one day. But they still ended up dying. But I am the bread of life. You believe in me? Guess what? You have life. Everlasting life. And let me just say this. It's not everlasting life that what? Begins later on when you die. It begins the moment you came to him. So here's the point I want you to see. Jesus states that the one who truly believes has everlasting life. So here's what he's saying. He is offering life that is eternal and not temporal. He's offering you something that is forever, not temporary. And we understand that, right? So I, I've been really struck with this recently. So, I, you know, I, I, we have two vehicles in our home, and Lori drives the one vehicle when she goes to work, and I drive... The Yukon, which I like. I like our Yukon. Okay, so I remember when we got it more than 10 years ago, I have, I have driven that thing into the ground, okay? And I keep doing what I have to do to keep it going. Well, it's at the point now where every week it's something new, and I'm, I've come to the conclusion that I have to stop doing what it needs to do to keep going. I've got to give it up. Because the Yukon is not eternal. It's temporal, especially here in Pennsylvania. Now, if I lived in South Carolina, it would live forever as long as I keep that engine going. Why? Because it isn't going to rust. Here we have something that we put on the roads that destroys our vehicles. We keep a whole industry in, in business. Because it's temporal. They don't make eternal cars. It's temporal. So we understand temporal, right? We understand. So like right when we're done, we're going to go somewhere to eat. We either got something at home or we're going to go to a restaurant. We're going to stop by Sheets. And we're going to get something to eat and we'll be satisfied for the moment. And we'll curl up on a couch for an afternoon nap. But then when we get up, guess what? It was temporal. The spiritual life is not that, is it? He gives you something eternal. And guess when it began? Not later when you die. The moment you believed. And so Jesus is saying, that inward pull is pulling you to something that will satisfy you beyond all comprehension and it's not just for now it's forever you have jesus forever so here's how he makes that final point why does this happen look with me verse 51 here's what he's saying i am the living bread which came down from heaven if anyone eats of this bread he will live forever and the bread that i shall give him is my flesh which I shall give for the life of this world. Now, the folks who are listening to him, we're going to find out next week, they can't understand what he's saying. They're taking him literally. What do you mean? We got to eat you? No, that's not what he's talking. He's talking figuratively here, though. But when he says he gives his flesh, we know he'll do that, right? He'll give his flesh by what? By having it nailed to a cross. So here's the point. Jesus proclaims that he will give his life for the life of the world. And eating of him is what? Committing yourself to him. 
believing in him. That's why, like in the Psalms, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You can't taste God. Not physically. But what it means is, is experience him. Because you enter into that relationship with him, that you are committed to follow him. And it's because he what? He gave his life for you. It comes back to, it begins with him, God drawing you to you, to him, to what? His giving his life for you so that you could have what? A relationship. So where are we going with this, George? All right, here's where we are. Here's what I want you to see. Sometimes we struggle with how much does he care for me? Do you ever get that way? Especially if you're going through it, you wonder, does he really, really care for me? Doesn't he know what's going on right now? Doesn't he know that I can't handle this? So when you come to a discussion like this in chapter 6 where he talks about him being the bread of life and he talks about no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. And the Father is the one who opens up the word of God so that they understand and therefore they come to me. And, and, and here's what I do. I give myself, eat of my flesh. What I give my flesh for the life of the world. Here's what I want you to see about this whole discussion. Where does it, where does it equate to where I am right now? Here's where it's at. He really wants a relationship with you. Do you hear me? He really wants a relationship with you. He wants to interact every moment in your life. And because he wants that, he did everything to make sure that it happens from even stirring your heart to even consider him to the reality of giving his life so that you could enter into that relationship. He did everything. Don't ever question that he loves you. He loves you. Why? Because he does everything from creating the pull in your heart to go to him to making sure that you can go to him. He did it all. All you have to do is say, yes. Yes, I'm here. Meet with me, Jesus. Isn't that awesome? And listen, did anything that he talked about here say anything about what you had to do or what I had to do? Nothing said anything there about what you and I had to do. Well, except one thing. Believe. Trust. Commit yourself to him. By faith. That's what it is. He wants to meet with you. So he did everything he can to make sure that that happened by giving Jesus for your sacrifice. Now the question is, what are you and I going to do with that? Well, I already know Jesus. No, no. It's more than just whether or not you're saved. What are you going to do with that? You're going to step through the door and have a relationship with him? Or what? What do you mean, George? Well, listen, if you, if you go over to Revelation, I think it's interesting. We use this verse for evangelism. It's not that. It's not an evangelistic verse, although people use it for that. That's okay. But in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus makes this statement. <clears throat> he says... Verse 20, behold, you've heard it, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. Now, we say that's a great, great evangelistic verse, George, and we've used that. I've used that for evangelism. That's not what he's talking about. That's not who he's addressing to. He's talking to a church here. He's saying, I'm knocking, church. I did everything. Open the door, and I'll meet with you. May we meet with him because he wants to have that relationship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your goodness in our lives and I thank you for your word and our, your word is not just so that we gain knowledge, although we do, Lord. Your word is to reveal to us who you are, what you have done, what you're calling us to. And Lord, we've already said it earlier in the service that this is not about just having a service. This is not about just ritual or, or beliefs. This is about you. And Lord, today it's about what you have done so that we can have a relationship with you. So, Lord, please help us. Help us to grow closer in that relationship with you. You know where we're at. You know exactly where we're at. So be you to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, um, hope you'll have a good fall day. Hope it's not going to rain. I don't think it's calling for rain. Uh, again, the chapter four verse cards, if you are wanting the verse cards for the study, they're located right down here. If you haven't gotten a book, we still have books. We encourage you to do that. We'll get you a study guide if you want to do that. Uh, the elders will be down front to talk to you or pray with you with whatever your needs are. Let's stand together and we'll ask God's blessing as we go, okay? Father, we do thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you for just being able to meet with you. Lord, you know that as we leave this place, we want to grow closer in our relationship with you. Help us as we face the things that we will face. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Guide us through this week. May your blessing be on each and every one here, we ask Jesus. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, folks, have a great week.